move. And so it's not about me doing something special. It's just about us coming in here to, to hear you. So Father Kyle gets out of the way and we say, Holy Spirit, have your way. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So tonight, uh, I'm, I've entitled this message, The Believer's Mindset. The Believer's Mindset. Um, tonight, it's not going to be anything you haven't heard before. It's not going to be anything that's, uh, that hasn't been taught from here before. But I'm going to bring some perspective uh, from an angle that maybe you've not seen. I'm going to invite you into the world of how, in a sense, principles I've learned through law enforcement and the mentality that we use to train with to be effective in day-to-day -day life. You have to realize as believers, we are in warfare. We've all been deputized by the Father. We've been given authority in His name by His blood, by, his test by our testimony. We've been given a word. We've been given training. We're getting trained every, I mean, 24-7, anybody here, you're getting trained. So I want you to realize there actually isn't a difference between you and I. It's just about how you see things. All right? So we're going to jump into this tonight. It's going to be a lot of fun. So I'm going to read a few things here. You and I have been created to live differently from the world we have been raised in. The culture you know today is easily offended, hurt, judged, opinionated, self-centered, tired, lazy, medicated, sick, and the list goes on. We are confronted with new issues on a daily basis from all the mountains of influence, situations, circumstances, and people challenging and debating the mindsets we have developed. Some of those mindsets have been established with good intentions, but lack the ability to bring about transformation and demonstration of the Christianity we say we believe. The word we speak, we see no change. The prayers we pray, we see no change. The songs we sing, we see no change. And left with the question, why is this not working? How many of us have been there? Maybe you're there today. We were talking about it, man. There's a lot of times you don't feel anything. If there's anything I'm learning, coming 13 years, I've been born again, saved, filled with the Holy Spirit, March 2010, right here is where it all began, right? Pastor waits when he listens to the Lord. So if you're out there and you're like, man, I'm, I'm going to wait him out. It won't happen. He'll wait you out, <laughs> find you out, and then get you plugged in here. But I want you to know I'm learning more and more that God's bringing me from a place of me experiencing him uh, from, a, from a natural standpoint to me being able to know him from a knowledge standpoint. And a lot of times, you know, it's all about growth. See, the thing is, it, it, we'll go on a little rabbit trail for a second. We don't want maturity because there's responsibility attached to that. We don't want maturity. See, I was asking God, I said, man, what's the problem we deal with in, in Christianity right now? Like, what do you want me to talk to people about? He said, people are passive. We're pushed around. We allow things to be more real to us than what he is. We allow circumstances to speak more truth to us than what his word says. You go, okay, you say, oh, Romans 8. This isn't in the notes, but we're going to go there. Romans chapter 8, we could probably quote it, but, you know, I think sometimes we become so dependent and comfortable at times. But do you realize that Back in the day, they didn't have none of the technology we had. You know, when they had church, there's churches today that meet by the leading of the Holy Spirit of where to go at because if it was announced, they'd all be killed. So think about you being led by the Spirit. Man, there's a, there's a side of this thing that, man, I want to know some more about it. I mean, do you realize people translated in the New Testament? I mean, they it's happened. I mean, so it's just, I'm not speaking down to us, but I'm saying there's... It's so easy to live in a culture where we, we can be conditioned to only believe God to this much because nothing else, there's no persecution, there's no pressure. Have you ever noticed that when you go through things in life, you see God sometimes move the most because it's when you get to the end of yourself and you begin to depend on him like you never depend on him before and you begin to see him move like you never seen him before. You have a loved one that's in the hospital and man, you probably haven't read those healing scriptures in months or years, and that's okay, and God's faithful, but it ought to be that alive to you because it's not just for that moment. See, what I'm trying to get to is there's a mentality. We're talking about faith. All this is rooted in faith. It's, a, it's not just, I mean, I get ahead of myself. It's not just about this idea that we have, right? I'll go through and we'll come back to Romans 8, whole day. I think we all can relate 
what I was talking about earlier about the question, to this reality. And today I want you to know that your mindset has to do with everything. The question is, what is the believer's mindset? Anybody have any thoughts? What's, when you would think, man, what's a believer's mindset? If someone says, what's your mindset as a believer? What would be some things that come to mind? Trust. Hope. Anybody else? Because you're going to meet somebody, you know. Tomorrow you're going to run into them. You're going to ask this question. Love. What else? It's not complicated. Anybody else? Those are all right answers. I wrote this down. uh, What is the believer's uh, mindset? The superior reality we are to only live in and be governed by in our life. The believer's mindset is the superior reality. Talk about faith. We are to only live in and be governed by in our lives. The mindset of the believer comes from and is rooted in the identity one walks in as a child of God. So you say, where does this mindset come from? In order for you and I to have the mind and reality of God operational in our lives, we must first have the heart of God. We must first have the heart of God. See, in order for you and I, though, to have the heart of God, we have to become born again. We have to have an encounter with Him. We weren't born with this conscious reality of the Father. Yeah, we were looking for something, but we didn't know what it was. It was His goodness that brought us. We didn't have faith when we were brought into this world. Faith came on the inside of us the moment we got born again, and now all of a sudden we begin to have the heart of God. Because, see, the thing is, how God, the, God's mind and God's heart are actually the same thing. And we're not going to have time to dig into all this tonight, but, but when you begin to dig in what the word heart means, it means the inward part. It means the, the framework. It means um, um, the, the form of something. So in reality, it's the way of thinking. So what's God's heart is what, how God thinks. And how God thinks is what's in his heart. So the question tonight is Romans 8. We'll come back to here. Romans 8, 38. For I'm persuaded. That word persuaded means cannot be convinced otherwise, is what the Lord told me one time. Notice it's not, I'm becoming persuaded, I'm getting persuading. I am persuaded, past tense. So that tells me, before he ever even wrote any of this, he had an understanding, I can't be convinced anything else other than what he's about to tell you. So I need you to understand, this is the believer's mindset. It's one that cannot be convinced otherwise. What is convinced or conviction? It's an experience. So you say, what's this have to do with anything? We've all encountered, first point tonight, the heart of God through a born-again experience. i got some scriptures for you up on the screen we're going we're to go through. I'm going to look here and read them with you. It's going to be uh, 2 Corinthians 5.17. It's a popular set of scriptures. We all, we can quote it. But as he gets it up there, but it's, oh, wait, there. yeah. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's what? A new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become brand new. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but should have what? Everlasting life. I like this next one. I found this one today. You'll like these two, Pastor Paul. He likes them all. But I like to look for ones that makes him think, wow, that was good. Ezekiel 11, verse 19. Then I will give them one heart. And I will put a new spirit within them and take the stony heart out of their flesh and give them a heart of the flesh. Ezekiel 36, 26. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit and I will put within you and I will remove the heart of stone from flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Hebrew, I mean, sorry, Jeremiah 31, 33. For this is the covenant that I have made with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them. This is important to remember this. Law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. So let's just hold up right there while we're reading this. He says, so so I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God. 
it's not just good enough to have a knowledge of the word. It's got to drop down in here. There's something about how, how, there's something about when, when you hear somebody who talks the talk, but there's something about when you see by somebody who walks the walk and they're convinced about what they believe in. That they're persuaded because that word has what? Come alive, that it's become written in their hearts. It's evident that there is no convincing this joke. You ain't telling him otherwise, right? You ever have those people who are super stubborn, right? You're like, it don't matter. You could, you could give them all the facts, and they're still just right. But why can't we learn to be that way about what we believe in? Why are we so easily talked out of things now? See, God, God, because I used to be challenged with this in Bible school, and even in law enforcement now, you're challenged with different mindsets, different beliefs, different lifestyles, all these things. And I don't have to back God's word up. I'm just called to believe it and demonstrate it. He said he'll confirm his word with signs following. Not Kyle's going to confirm the word with signs following. He said he's going to do it. Now, I think sometimes we allow our pride and our ego to get in the way because if we really knew who we were, we wouldn't have to argue with people. If we really knew who we were, and that's what, once you get born again, you're dead in Christ, that I died, now he's alive in me, so how do I get offended? It's because I'm not dead yet. You know? So it's, I want to challenge us tonight that we have to have the heart of God in order to have the mindset of God. Amen? We're going to our last verse here, and I love this. It's 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For God made Christ who never sinned through the offering of our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ, or we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. What's righteous mean? In right standing with. So not only do you get the heart of God when you get born again, you get in right standing with God. And not only are you in right standing with God, guess what? You're seated with God. So these are things that we're taught here. And, and, and I don't, it's never, people say beating a dead horse, but you're not because you can never get too much of, of the reminded of the truth. See, because in law enforcement, when you train, it's the basics that keep you alive. It's the basics that allow you to do your job every day. In, in, in every job, it's the basics and the fundamentals. It's, it's hitting a ball. It's basics. I heard a guy say this the other day. Um, a guy asked Kenneth Copeland why, why pro golfers were just so great. And they said, because they learned to master the basics. So it's not about having this deep theological understanding and all these experiences. It's simply you learning just to fall in love with who he is, what he's done, what he's doing, and what he wants to do through you. It's the basics. And the basics tonight is what? I got the heart of God when I got born again. Number two, we're going to, what's the mind of God? Go to Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 12. I'll let you get there. I got them on the screen, but I'll wait till you get there. When you get there, say amen. Talking about the mind of God. We got born again. We got the heart of God. Now we're going to discover the mind of God. Through relationship. Because God wants to speak to you and I on a personal level. You know, you're important to God. He knows exactly where you're at. He knows exactly what you're doing. He knows where you're going, when you're doing it, and when you're not going to do it. He knows what you're going to ask before you ask it, but he still lets you ask anyways because he's such a good father that he's not going to push himself on you. Man, he wants to be involved in your life. And he's involved now. But, right? I can be as much as involved, my, right, my son and I, I can be just as much involved or not involved in his life as I want to. He'll always be my son and I'll always be his dad, but I have to be intentional to actually mean, to mean something. Don't take for granted just because you may, I'm at church, man, God is jumping up and down, man, I got to be with me today. I'm driving down the road and the kids, and I remember my mom used to always say, I just love silence. Can I just have silence? I never understood that as a kid. Can you just turn the radio off and be quiet for a few minutes? I get it now. But at the end of the day, God values these moments with you. Don't just be waiting for a Sunday. He's waiting to talk to you on Monday morning, Tuesday morning. He's waiting to talk to you in the shower while you're changing, while you're putting on clothes, while you're making your calendar. Why? It's because it's the governing mindset that you're living from. It's not an idea or a way of life. It has to be so involved and consumed that this isn't just what I do. This is who I am and where I'm from, right? The Bible says that we live in this world, but we're not from it, that we're seated in heavenly places, far above all principalities and powers and might name that is name. 
corn. We live from a different zip code, right? These are things that we've all heard, but we have to allow it to not just be something we believe, but it's the reality, the dominating superior realm we live from. Our faith won't work if we don't live from this realm. Our prayers won't work if we don't live from this realm. I'm not saying God doesn't work with where we're at, right? He understands where we're at, but I want to say we can go even deeper here. We can go further here because God's wanting to do, if God wants to do something he's never done in a community, then he's going to, he's going to have to take you somewhere you've never gone. Yeah. Yeah. Come on, right? That means we got to put in the work, not about performance, but about discovering the heart that's always been there to learn about. Because what I'm realizing is that if I'm made in his image and the more I pursue him, the more I find out who I am to start with. Yeah. Right? Who you are was never meant to be, to be figured out. It was meant to be discovered. Your purpose and plan in life was never meant to put it on paper and let's see where I'm supposed to go. It's meant to be discovered from the superior realm of knowing that you have the heart of God. So let this mind be in you which also was in Christ Jesus. That word mind means inner man or heart. Like I was a real, uh, relating to earlier, the heart of God is the mind of God. I think we got a hold of that. But we're going to go through a few more just uh, fundamental scriptures. Romans 12, 1 and 2. How do you get the mind of God? I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living uh, sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable act of service. Notice that it's just reasonable. It's not hard to renew your mind. It's a choice to give up your right to not want to change. See, the reason why we don't want to change is because we can't control the narrative if we have to change. What's the story really is that you're redeemed and he wants to use you and love you, but we're too afraid to get vulnerable with him when he already knows already. But the bigger thing is what I want us to realize too is that this isn't just about you. Salvation is important and we know that. We know it's about being born again. We know it's about him living in us. We know it's about reaching and discipling a community, right? We can, we can all probably quote the great, great commission. But this thing called uh, uh, Christianity is about people. God uses people to reach people. He needs you, right? If a church is going to be effective in the community, the church isn't the building, but the church needs you. Kids can't be ministered to if you're not present with the presence of God, right? I mean, we can go through this. When you start seeing this as from a, from a superior realm and understanding that what you have to offer is, is invaluable, and it's, and it's God loves you so much, you don't even think about you anymore because you understand that you have his heart because you have his heart. You know what he's got you taken care of. And now you can go and be a blessing because it's about the plan of God is what we're getting to. But we have to get the mind of God, the heart of God, and alive in us again. Right? So we do this by renewing our minds. Joshua 1.8, let this book of the law not depart of your mouth, but you shall meditate day and night and then may observe to do according to all that is in it. So it's not just good enough to meditate in it, but it's to observe, it, and it's to see it happen in other people's lives in your own life. And for then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Good success. But I have a part to play of renewing my mind. This is my favorite. I saw this one today, and I just could have stopped here. Ephesians 4, 22 through 24 in the King James, New King James. That you may put off concerning your formal conduct, the old man, with grown, uh, gross, corrupt according to deceitful lust, and renewed in the spirit of your mind. Pause. That word spirit of mind again, it connects to, right, the heart of God. Notice how we're, the, the correlation you're seeing, mind and heart, mind and heart, his heart. And his mind are the same. When you have God's heart, you learn God's mind. It's important. You're like, I don't understand why you're hearing this, but it'll make sense here in a minute. And that you put on the new man, which was created according to Christ in true righteousness and in holiness. Put it on. Now, here's the amplified. Comes across louder. Let's amplify it. That's awesome. It's easy, but I like it. Strip yourselves of your former nature. Put off and disregard your old, unrenewed self. Man, that's pretty simple to me. Just strip it off. I don't need an explanation. How many times your people, well, let me clean up first. Now just start where you're at. God, I'm stripping off. Lord, I'm stri Lord, today I strip myself of my former nature, and I put off and disregard my old, renewed self. 
which characterized by previous manners of life and become corrupt through the lust and desires which spring forth to lose. And be constantly renewed in the spirit of your what? Having a flesh, mental, and spiritual attitude. A flesh, mental, spiritual attitude. So notice it's not just spiritual. There's a mental side to this that we have our part to play. And you're like, Kyle, where are we going with this? Well, it's deeper. So it'll make sense in a minute. So there's a spiritual, right? Past Paul said earlier, there's a natural realm and a spiritual realm. And it's going to make sense how all this works. Verse 24, and put on the new nature, the regenerated self, created in God's image, God like and true righteousness and holiness. And you can go read all the way. I encourage you, if you haven't read that in that translation, it's just loaded. Actually, at the top of that uh, uh, chapter 4, it talks about the Christian way of living or the Christian nature. Very, very good. And last but not least, 2 Timothy 2.15. Be diligent to present yourselves approved to God. A worker to do does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We have a responsibility to get in this book. See, that's the, uh, in our culture, right, we live in the most fathers generation ever. So you've got to realize that the people that are being influences to our communities outside of, you know, that, are, that, are, that, that have fathers and have good Christian morals and discipline, they don't have fathers. They don't know the Father, therefore they don't know his heart, they don't know his mind, they don't know how to, it affects everything. So we have a part to play that we need to make sure we're getting this book and we're finding out God's heart for ourselves. Not, and it's not about, because uh, Billy may know a, a, a part of God's heart that I may never know because he has experience with it. He has time with him. And see, when we start to get back to a culture of honor, which is a whole other topic for another time, I'll be able to hear what he has to say because I'll honor the spirit that's in him. It's the same one that's in me. The way I reverence Holy Spirit when he moves in the room is no different than how I should reverence the people I'm talking to that's beside me. See, we got to see it from a different lens because there's something big that he wants to do, but if we don't see it right, we're going to miss it. And we're not going to be a people that miss it. And we're not because that's why we're here. That's why you see what God's doing in our church, in our community, in our families. There's blessing on it. Why? Because we have the mind of God here. And we have the heart of God here. And it's preached and it's taught and people here pursue it. We all pursue it. And that's what makes it amazing. So this brings me into ultimately, you have the heart of God. You have the mind of God. We know what the plan of God is. And now I want to talk about, like we talked about earlier, these mindsets. So now that we understand, we'll go back to the top and then we're going to go through a few practical stuff today. Everyone good? Makes sense? Everyone's following me? I'm not holding you too long here. Just give me a few minutes and we'll get through it. It says, the mindset, here we go. The superior reality we are to live in and be governed in in our life. So all this is rooted in our identity. We figured that out. By knowing who we are, we have the heart of God, we have the mind of God, and it's rooted in our identity. We're persuaded. So I want, what I want you to know is that in ancient past, it was useful for our ancestors to respond quickly to predators, to escape, fight, or flight action. In modern society today, we face different threats, and the few are far in between. However, the same evolutionary response are still deeply embedded within our body. When there's a situation the body deems to be unsafe, it responds. This part of the brain responds for memory, emotion, or survival. It acts as a base of operation. It automatically jumps into action and largely instinctive protective measures to safeguard you. See, so what I'm wanting to bring in tonight is those questions earlier when I said when we're reading the word, it's not working. We're singing, it's not working. We're praying, it's not working. I want you to understand that maybe it's because we've not had a made-up mindset of knowing who we are. Because, see, in the natural, as you begin to renew your mind, there is actually a part of your brain called the amygdala, and it actually stems from memories, emotions, things you experience, and things you encounter. And when you go through things in life, it's what draws to that for you to be able to respond appropriately or not appropriately. So in law enforcement, example of training of the basics of every day of what we do, we drill, we drill, we drill, we drill, and we don't ever just treat it like another common day. Because the moment you're confronted with conflict, you're always going to go back to what you've put into your training. It's the same spiritually. 
I want you to know there actually something is physically happening in you as you're taking the time to renew your mind and you're reading God's word and you're studying about what he's doing and you're, and you're understanding your identity. You're going to be faced with conflict as a believer. You're going to be confronted with challenges. You're going to be confronted with things. And I want you to know you can win in those circumstances. But here's how you have to win. You have to establish yourself knowing you never can be ever defeated. Every day I go to work, I know I'm coming home. Every call I go on, I know I'm going to be just fine. Because I've taken the time to study. I've taken the time to train, to know what it is to deal with any situation. It's the same in our lives as believers. we got a lot of conflict coming down the road. It's the world we live in. Jesus said that there's, he said there's trials and tribulations. You're going to experience those. Be a good cheer. I've already overcome them. He had a mind, Jesus understood, he was in a culture of conflict. He was the most cultured conflict individual you could read about. Religious culture, financial culture, business culture. That, that's all the places we all live and work in every day. But you notice he thrived in it because he knew who he was, because he knew who his father was, and he knew what he carried. So I want you to know that there's a way that you can actually work through this conflict that some of us have been facing. We've all faced it. It could be big, it could be small, but it's still conflict. So I want you to know that in conflict, there's four responses that we have in the natural. We have a fight response. We have a flight response. Number three, we have a freeze response. And number four, we have a fawn response. So what's fight? All of a sudden you're in a situation and you're like, Man, I got to do what I do to, to get through this. That's a fight response. What do got to do to fix it? What do got to do to take care of it? Prime example of these four things. How many of y'all have been hungry today? Man, I'm hungry. Guess what? You're like, man, I got to do something. Two, now I got to think about what I'm going to do about this hunger. Three, now I got to make a decision on where I'm going to eat to deal with my hunger. And four, I'm going to go feed. It's a prime, it's simple but you can relate the concept into everyday life as a believer. What are you going to do about it? And you say, Kyle, where do you get this stuff from? Well, here's, here's an acronym for you. OODALOO, O-O-D-A. You can write down, O-O-D-A, LOO. And I'm going to give you what each one of those mean. The first O means observe. In the process of going through conflict as a believer and as an individual in the world we live in, we got to be observant. We got to be mindful of what's going on around us. We got to be mindful, not because the devil's on the loose and obviously we know he's defeated, but we got to be, we can't be ignorant of his devices. We can't be ignorant of situations and things that we're faced with and things that we're being challenged with. So we got to be observant. And in the middle of this conflict we're observing, there's going to be the second O is orient, or I'm going to process the situation that's going on. Man, we're so quick just to cut our, just to say, man, it's over. Come on, man. We got a persuaded mindset, though. We, this thing is going to beat me. This bill showed up in the mail. I don't care. I'm, li well, man, I've been living on credit. Praise the Lord. He's going to pay that car off. He knows what's going on. Man, I, all of a sudden, someone's uh, uh, passed away. Man, I'm going to step in that situation and be hope to a family member. Right, But i got to be able to see it right. I'll notice how all this is governed from knowing who I am. Because if you know who you are, you're going to respond right. Next, now that you've made the decision of what's going on, D stands for decision. Now you got to do something about it. And I think a lot of times this is where people, um, they fight. Because when i got to make a decision, i got to either know I'm right or that I'm wrong. But when you know who you are, and you know you can't be defeated, you're right because you know you're right. And it's not because you're being prideful, it's because who you are is rooted in here. Who you are is rooted in this word. Who you are is, if his word doesn't return back void, this is what he said, I'm not moving, it don't matter what I feel, don't matter what I see, this is my decision factor. And guess what? The A, you can guess it, you act. So I want you to realize that, that we, in, in life, there's going to be conflict as a believer. We're going to be faced with things and challenged with things. And in the natural, I wanted to kind of bring in, it's a, it's a broad topic I try to narrow down. There's actually things going on in your mind. When you're in that book, you're reminding yourself of stories, of victory. You're reminding yourselves of, of testimonies, of what people have come through. 
when you come here on Sunday, you hear people about their victory that week. Guess what? You're just building an index. Because when conflict happens, have you heard people say, my life flashed before my eyes? Well, it really didn't happen. What happened was, was your brain was going back to your amygdala to pull on your experiences that it could relate to a situation and step into a moment. See, the thing is, we're all going to experience it. But we don't have to be stuck in it. See, we're all going to face shock at times. Some things, man, they shock you. Knock the breath out of you. Have the air knocked out of you doing sports? Oh! And for a moment, you're like, but I got to get back up. Game's still rolling, clock's still rolling, ball's still going. Let's get up, go down the field. Right? We all have a shock moment. And in that shock moment, it doesn't matter how smart, how versed, how great of a person you are. You can't pull on the knowledge that you have at that moment. So don't feel bad. I want to encourage you, don't beat yourself up because you didn't have the right answer in the moment. You didn't have the ability to access it then because of what you experienced or what you're going through. But what you can do, though, is you can shorten that time of how long you're going to stay in this oodle loop moment. Because as, as you study and you become this week, get in your word and knowing who you are, that, that financial problem may have got you last time, but it ain't getting you this time. That concern about where your kids are going to go when they graduate or how's it going to be about being a new mother and father and raising children or Man, you have to raise your grandkids because of life situation and choices your kids make. Because I got a history book, because I got stories, because I've trained myself, I know I, I'm going to win. And I want you to walk out of here tonight knowing you can't be defeated. If there's anything I want you to get out of this at all, out of all that, because I know it's a lot to process, is that you can't be defeated. Nothing can take you out. When you get rooted and grounded in that, you're unshakable. Because faith has nothing to do with fear. It has everything to do with the identity of who he is, and he's not ever going to compromise. I don't have to explain it. I'm just here to show up. I'm just here to enforce it. Serve and notice. And that's what we're called to do in people's everyday life. Because your training, people are dependent on you out here in the world. That's where the God plan comes in. You investing you may think this is just for me, but think bigger. There's people that's dependent on you seeking and studying and pursuing the Lord. I know sometimes it's hard. I went 15 weeks in an academy where I was in a stress-inoculated environment where it was challenging. I didn't really get to read and pray as much. Did that mean God wasn't with me? No, I learned to adjust. He's with me when I'm working out. He's with me when I'm eating. He's with me when I'm getting ready for my day. It wasn't, oh, man, now I don't have a hour I used to have. No, I just adjust. But why? Because my training is more dependent, not just for me, but it's for the people I'm going to go reach. And let that be something encouraging you. When you get your Bible and you're pursuing the things of the Lord, remember, it's bigger than you. What about that person tomorrow you're going to meet is going to need that verse you were studying? It's going to need to hear that song you were singing. Just because God wants to use you. Not just to deal with your own conflict, but to deal with others. Because when you're in this place and knowing who you are, because you have the heart of God and you have the mind of God, you can help see the plan of God come to pass and you'll never think twice about your own life. Does that make sense? Well, let's pray tonight. Father, we come to you tonight. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for moving here in the room. And we thank you, God, that we go out of here knowing that nothing can convince us of who you are, of what you've done, of what you're doing and what you're about to do in and through our lives and in this church. Father, we come to you tonight and we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you, Father, that we remind ourselves of the words that you have spoken. Lord, I thank you that as, as we were in worship, Lord, just as you promised Abraham and Sarah a child, Father, that, 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 you're, that they, didn't, they didn't waver in the circumstance. Lord, they stood on your promise. And I thank you tonight, God, that you're bringing back promises that you spoke to people in the room years ago. Months ago, even as they were children, God, I thank you, you're reminding them of those promises and that they will come to pass. That just because they haven't seen it doesn't mean it's not going to happen, Father. And I pray tonight that you would encourage us, pray you would strengthen us, and I pray, God, you give us opportunity this week to take on some conflict and to see your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, in and through our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, that's all I have for you. Well, it's technically not all I have, but I uh, hope you guys got something out of that and challenge you guys. So there you go.